Well, it's uh, 7.01, and uh, I'll call the meeting to order for Tuesday, 25th of May, uh, 2021. Uh, this is the Selco, uh, the Shrewsbury Electric and Light Cable the Selco Commission uh, meeting. As a preliminary matter, this is Robert Holland, the Shrewsbury Electric C and Cable Operations Commissioner. Please permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Uh, Tony Trippi. Yes, I'm here. Okay, Kelly Marshall. Not yet, but she'll, she'll be coming in a little bit later. Uh, Maria Lemieux. Here. Okay, Mike Rafolo. Here. Okay, staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Christopher Roy, Selco General Manager. Yes. Uh, Ralph Iacarino, Director of Engineering and Compliance. Here. Uh, Joel Malavar, Director of Broadband Technologies. Here. Uh, Jackie Pratt, Director of Integrated Resources and Communications. Here. Greg Honorado, Director of Information Technology. Nope. Nothing heard. Uh, John, uh, Jonathan uh, Malavar, Senior Engineer. Here. Patrick Collins, Integrated Resources Analyst. Here. Tracy Schultz, Human Resources Coordinator. Here. And uh, Jim Zocco, uh, Director of Finance and Administration. I have that right, Jim? Correct, and here. Okay, great. Thanks for joining us. Uh, it's your first time, I think, and welcome to the uh, festivities. Thank um, you. Introduction to, to the remote meeting. Uh, good evening. This uh, open meeting of the Cell Phone Commission is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of COVID-19 virus. The order allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. For this meeting, the Selco Commission is convened by Google Meet as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please be sure to press star six to mute your device. The meeting will not feature public comment. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. Uh, and as we proceed down the uh, the road here, I, I as always, uh, want to pass on to Mark Sarah and the SMC folks. Uh, th th thanks for their support. So, with that, uh, we'll go to the, uh, the agenda for the for the day. And I think the first one we get is what the minutes for the last meeting. Do we have any comments? From anyone? No. Okay. And that would be, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm I jumped to go ahead first, but to the meet, uh, these are the mi minutes for the uh, April 20th, uh, 2021 meeting. Uh, do we have a motion to approve the, uh, the minutes as presented? I move that we approve the minutes. As okay, presented. Tony. Do we have a second? Uh, a second, but I do have a uh, correction. Yes, Mike, Michael, what's up? Uh, the, there's a statement uh, attributed to me where I asked about management rep letters, REP, but it's stated as a capital REC rec, like, as in rec credit, but it's really management representation letter. Okay. And we uh, we'll note rep, that. And we say management rep letter for that. Okay. With, uh, so you'll second, and Tony, your first, we'll take a roll call vote uh, to approve the minutes of uh, April 20th, 2021, as uh, corrected by uh, Mr. Rafola. Uh, the roll call uh, vote, uh, Mr. Trippi. Yeah. Uh, is Kelly Marshall on yet? No. Okay. Yeah. Maria, Maria Lemieux. Yes. Okay. And yeah. Mike Rafolo. Uh, yeah, I might have heard Kelly. But, yeah. But... Yeah, I think Kelly just uh, signed on as well. Kelly. Okay. And uh, Bob Holland. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, yep. we can. Uh, we were approving yep. the minutes from uh, April twentieth, uh, twenty twenty one. Mike Rafolo had one co correction, and we, we were we've approving the minutes based on that correction. Yep, I approve. Okay, uh, we'll go back to the one that I skipped over, and that's the review and consider uh, approval of the warrants and bill schedules. Uh, does anyone have any comments uh, uh, on the? Warrants and bills, and if and if not, can I have a motion to uh, approve them? And then I will sign for all of us uh, physically uh, at, up at the town hall. I um I just have one question. Yes, Maria. Bob, um, warrant two two one eight four. Um, 
there's a bill in there dated 12 16 20 for 27,500 vendor 10303 um i'm just curious if that was obviously it was um a construction project um was it just was this like a final payment or um was there an issue um just curious as to why it was dated like it was paid in april but dated december Uh, um, Chris, do you or do does, does Jim have a, a an idea? What can you again say the page, uh, Maria? It's like one of the last warrants. It's um, the first page in the last warrant. Um, tw it's two one eight four. The vendor is one zero three zero three. It's Amarello, so I know it's a construction project. Yeah, I'm in 2184. I'm just trying to find. It's like it's more towards the, go towards the bottom. That's like one of the yeah. last three three pages. Yes, yeah, 27. It's 27,500. It's the second item uh, on that warrant. Okay. Well. <laughs> no. Sorry. <laughs> I guess I'm just curious. Uh, like, obviously, it said, obviously it's, it's a construction project. Oh, here we are. Um, Sorry. AF Amor uh, Amorello and Son. Okay. Uh, okay. Twenty-seven thousand five hundred overhead devices distribution. Um, that's a was good it question. Work done? Yeah, was it work done for like fiber? I'm not recognizing that as a. Uh, oh, you, you know what? That could be the. Um, well, let, let me check and get back to you. Just so I, okay. I have the right. Uh, I don't recognize that as as one of the underground fiber contractors. So I just want to confirm, uh, uh, Amarillo. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, well, thank we, you. We'll just we'll hold off on the um, on the approval of the warrants. Uh, maybe uh, Jim can take a look at it or uh, go along the way and. We can determine what that is, and we'll, we'll readdress it before we close out the meeting. Is that uh, meet with everybody? Okay. With that, we'll move on to. Uh, That's fine. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, with that said, we'll go to the next item, which is the um, review of the monthly financials and discussion of reporting format. So, Chris, I'll turn that over to you. And see who you want to have to handle that? Excellent. Thank you. So, uh, so this uh, agenda item, uh, as you'll see, we can go through the attachment here. But as uh, everyone may have noticed, this is Jim Zocco's first meeting. So we figure uh, um, we would give him an opportunity to uh, just go through his his thoughts on a few things, solicit feedback on. Um, on some of our formatting ideas and what information is helpful for the commission. And then, um, we, you know, his, I, I, now I already, free, I think we're what, three weeks in. So, um, you know, certainly, uh, or four weeks, but, um, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll incorporate the feedback and, and the idea is to provide uh, a uh, refreshed uh, tool for uh, the monthly financial reporting and um, and so I, I will turn it over to Jim for his his uh, introduction thank you Chris and hello Selco uh, commissioner members um, I figure before I start I'll give you just a little bit of background about myself um, I worked in the last seven years at Belmont light I had a, uh, a couple different roles and I wore a ton of different hats which kind of gave me a good insight into how a utility kind of runs. 
how it's different from kind of a, a regular business and all those kind of little nuances. Um, some of my areas of expertise come in like accounting processes, how to you know review things, how to automate things, um, building internal controls. And over the last four weeks at Selco, from meeting with different employees, I can see that's something that they're they're interested in starting to, to take a look at. Um, you know, I'm somebody that I like to to get proactive on things over reactive. So you'll start to notice that as we go along. But uh, over the last few weeks, I was talking with Chris, and he told me how uh, my predecessor always gave a presentation, and you know, we talked about cash flow and stuff like that. And I figured offline at some point I could talk to people to understand you know, what type of value and, and information those type of um, reports were providing so I can make sure some of the ideas I have to share with everybody gives that same value. Um, being so new still, I wasn't able to put anything together that was my own. So the layout and everything that you're looking at comes from Mike. Um, I gave it just a little bit of a, a, an over touch, you know, format wise, just to make it a little pretty for this meeting. Um, but as we go over the next couple of months, um, well, I know we break for summer, but I'll, I'll have some different types of things. You'll see a little bit different of views and you let me know what kind of works, what we like to see and what we don't. But that said, I'll jump into the electric uh, financials and just going forward, one of the, the documents I think may provide some value for everybody is just kind of our summary income statement. And taking a look at this statement, there it compares both year over year, so this March to last March, but it also gives us a Q1 um, view of this year to last year. Those numbers are gonna be a little off because of COVID and we might know, notice some things. So we'll compare them also to the budget, which is, you're gonna see is a little more uh, on target and I want to speak to certain, you know, percentages that might jump out to people. But just kind of starting, when we look at, you know, 2021's operating revenue. Um, we are about 1% uh, below our budgeted number for the year right now. I mean, for the month of uh, March. And from a quarter perspective, we're about 11% over. When we jump down to operating, uh, total operating expenses um, from the budget, we are about 6% under, and uh, that's for the month. And then on the quarter, we're about 3% under as well. I started jumping into those numbers to kind of see why, because when you get to the next page and it jumps into the income statement, we notice that month to date, we're about 50%, 58% uh, over budget, I mean, over net income on budget, and then about 2,700% over on quarter to date. That number kind of jumps out. So I did a deeper dive, and this was one I was actually able to find some of the information on. And basically, the way we do our budgeting for revenue, we look at the previous year's kilowatt hours sold. Interesting enough, in January and February of 2020, we had some crazy weather. Now, as you guys probably already know, weather impacts our business great. In January, we had the warmest January in history. So dating back to 1880, that was the warmest January. February was the second warmest February in history dating back to 1880. So with that, that put 2020's kilowatt hours uh, sold a little on the lower side. Now flip to 2021, February was the second, or was the coldest February since 1989, and January had a bunch of record highs. So you kind of saw a double whammy from a uh, kilowatt hour budgeting perspective. We had a, a lower 2020, which made us mark a lower 2021 on the budget. Me and Chris kind of talked about some ideas we have to kind of prevent stuff like this from you know, happening going forward, maybe looking at budgeting some of this stuff over you know, a five-year average comparison to see if that kind of helps out. And uh, that's one of the reasons that we had a, a big variance there. Looking at uh, the total operating expense, there's uh, one line for customer and sales uh, expense. Looking at this, this jumped up on a quarter-to-date basis 
um, from budget about 65% over. Everything else is kind of under budget. So I did a little bit of a dive and our allowance for doubtful accounts increased from 2020, 2020 it was at uh, 13, 113,000 and we jumped it up in 2021 to 250,000. Now the reason for this is due to COVID. Um, as you guys may know, during 2020, we were not allowed to do collection processes because collection companies were closed for a bit. Um, the DPU would not let us uh, do shutoffs. And there are some customers out there, I know this from Belmont, I kind of handled some of that stuff over there that will not pay unless it is shut off season, which does come in July this year. Um, so we did have to increase that number and that number just wasn't budgeted for. So we see the kind of jump up there and those numbers kind of led to why we have such a higher uh, net income for electric a year to date at this point. Um, any question just about the uh, electric financials that I just kind of reviewed? Okay, there's no questions. We'll move on to cable. Now, I wasn't able to do as deep of a dive for cable to look at things, but I just wanted to go over kind of the, the highlight numbers from operating revenue uh, month to date. So in March, we are about 3% below uh, budget. And from a year to date perspective, we're about 1% below budget. Um, for operating expenses from a month, uh, uh, March to March, we're about 2% uh, below uh, budgeted number. And for quarter to date, we are about uh, 4% under. When we take a look jumping down to net income uh, from a March to March perspective, we are about 12% uh, below plan. And when we jump over to year to date, we're actually the opposite, where we're about 12% above. Um, right now, looking at everything, these numbers don't jump out as concerning to me. Um, over the next couple of months, I'm slowly going to be uh, jumping into my predecessor's uh, uh, files. He had a ton of Excel files. He was actually very masterful in how he created these, very creative in the logic behind him. I have to give him a lot of credit. Um, but since he's not here anymore, I'm going to have to kind of keep those going, bring them in and, and make them into my style. And as I slowly do that, you'll notice, you know, some of the format changing a little bit and it'll, it'll look just a little bit different, which more things to that, that I'm kind of used to. And I'd love to hear anybody as we go through stuff's feedback on those type of things. And if there's anything that you guys know already, you'd like to know or see that's different. Let me know at any point. Okay, thank you. Um, specifically, uh, Maria, any uh, any quick uh, suggestions or anything? Um, no, I, I think you know. For right now, I probably will reserve comment and then maybe mm. just sh shoot out an email with some things that sure. we've talked about, just yep. to. Um, just so like as we prepare for our next meetings, just maybe throw some ideas out there. Okay, great. Any, uh, any of the other uh, commissioners have any questions of uh, Mrs. Oko? Uh, Jim, this is Mike Rafal. I just wanna say welcome. Happy to have you here. Um, I'm glad to hear you talk uh, already, already getting involved and um, feel free to make it your own. Don't feel tied to your predecessor in my view, you know, that's. That's the value you're bringing to the table is, is how to make it your own. Um, and then uh, um, the other thing I'm always interested in and haven't heard a lot about is kind of efficiencies, how to make the how to make things, processes more efficient um, and perhaps how to make uh, expenses, kind of not control expenses. Sorry, because that's the wrong kind of phrase. I don't, I don't think we're spending money improperly, but to the extent that you see that you could uh, more from a financial standpoint, do things more efficiently. I would love to hear that kind of feedback. Okay. Sounds good. And thank you, Mike, Michael. This is Tony. I just want to uh, welcome you. And uh, I wonder a lot of times it seems like the budget variance seems to change quite a bit. It doesn't seem to match as much with one year to the next year. The budget seems to be all over the place. 
uh, maybe you can look into that. Will do, and thank you, Tony. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? If not, I don't think we have a vote on this one yet. We would, as, uh, we'll go on to the, <clears throat> to the next uh, topic, which is review and consider and approve the New York Power Authority recipients designated voting representative. And I believe uh, uh, Jackie Pratt is, uh, has the lead on that. Correct, Chris? Well, it's Chris's. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, uh, and we do have uh, some breaking news on Maria's original question on Amarello, if you'd like yes. to uh, take yeah. two steps back. Yeah, certainly. Uh, that was a, a paving. So we did some conduit work at the Rolf Ave substation. So that was a paving contractor. And indeed did complete work in December, uh, but I, I don't have an explanation about why it was paid in April. So that it was confirmed as, as work that was done in December, but it, it was for some reason delayed payment on, on the invoice. Okay, that, that was our, our warrant, that was our uh, agenda item number two. And uh, if we can go back to that and get a, a motion to accept the warrants and bill schedules then as updated. Uh, Tony, you, you had made the initial, uh, um, move to yes, uh, this, I accept. That. I make that motion again that we accept. Okay. And That's do we have a same. second? Second. Okay. And we'll do a roll call vote, uh, to approve the warrants and bills as accepted. And I was signed as, uh, um, I'm going to call your name for please uh, vote. Tony Trippy. Yes. Okay. Kelly Marshall. Yes. Maria Lemieux. Yes. And Mike Raffolo. Yes. Okay, and Bob Holland. Yes. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, we are again up to uh, agenda item five, which is review and consider on the New York Power Authority's uh, recipients designated voting representatives. Mr. Roy. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, on this one is, uh, uh, in my view, uh, considered a housekeeping item. The uh, two individuals currently uh, listed as designated voting representatives are both retired now. Uh, so uh, just as a quick background, uh, the, the purpose of this um, procedural matter is uh, is is uh, it, to serve as the voting representative for NIPA, the New York Power Authority. And what that means in this particular context is, um, geez, uh, you know, I guess I should have looked at the date, but, you know, uh, uh, so, you know, 100 years ago or, or 50 years ago, I should say, they put the hydro facility in upstate New York as a, uh, uh, as a, I guess, a, a really a public interest, uh, public benefit project. And, uh, and so that, that was a, a federal initiative as it borders Canada and the, and the power is, is wheeled through the New York Power Authority. And, um, and, and for those that aren't familiar, the New York Power Authority is basically the transmission owner. And it's it's a, uh, an interesting noteworthy point. It's the transmission owner and operator of the New York uh, grid and also a public power agency. And so if you'll see one of the headlines from the general manager highlights as a foreshadowing, that's similar to what um, Maine is, is considering as, as a more, uh, a larger power authority, much like New York does. So, but anyway, in this particular case, uh, this is for the hydro facility that as a public project, I, you know, I, I've heard a Several different stories, but um, but to summarize it as as a project um, that uh, was in as a public benefit, all neighboring states were uh, had to be uh, had access to the to the output, and so that's where um, MWIC acts as the Mass Department of Public Utilities management entity. And, and each off taker sends voting representatives to act on business matters that generally are contract negotiations when, when the, um, uh, the power purchase arrangements expire from time to time or, or, other, or other matters that 
um, have come up that require, uh, again, I think housekeeping items. So it's, it's really the, our, our, our voting voice for how New York Power uh, Authority operates the hydro facility and agrees on the rates. Um, so as you can see, the list is quite it is extensive. It encompasses all public power in, in Massachusetts. And okay, so what we're really voting for is to have you be the primary and Jackie Pratt be the secondary or the alternate. Correct. Okay. And that's what's really before the board tonight. Okay. Do we have a motion to uh, approve um, Mr. Roy as the primary and Jackie Pratt as the uh, secondary to the uh, uh, NYPA recipients designated uh, voting representatives. So I so move. move. Okay. Second. Okay, we have second. We have uh, Mr. Rafolo is uh, moved. Uh, Mr. Trippi, I'll take yours as a second. Uh, we'll do a roll call. No, vote I'll, to I'll, approve, I'll uh, second it. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Trippi, your vote. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, Kel Kelly Marshall. Yes. Kelly? Kelly? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, Marie yep. Lemieux? Yep. <laughs> yes. Okay, Mike Rafolo? Yes. Okay, and Bob Holland, yes. Okay, with that, uh, we'll move on to uh, item six, review and consider approval of the COVID electric relief program. Mr. Roy? All right, I think uh, that one I will, if with your permission, pass the baton to Jackie. So uh, I'll be happy to take that one on. Um, so the commission had voted to allocate $10,000 in surplus funds back in November or December to help supplement the Share the Warmth program. Um, when we actually received our applicants for the year and the money was dispersed in March, what we had noticed was a, few, a lower number of applicants, fewer applicants coming through than even in a normal year. Never mind during a year where we've had a pandemic and we know that the need out there is great. So at that time, we earmarked the 10,000 that the commission had allocated with the intent that we would try to come up with an idea, a program to get this money to the customers that need it most. And here, as we sit on the eve of resuming terminations, as Jim had mentioned, there was a, a, an extensive moratorium during the pandemic when electric terminations for non-payment were not allowed. Uh, we're looking at resuming those in, in July, and uh, we've got quite a few customers on the termination list with very high bills. Uh, so the proposal here is to take that $10,000 and run it similarly to how we run the Share of the Warmth. Um, applicants would apply through our partner agencies, which in this instance is uh, Shrewsbury Council on Aging, Shrewsbury Youth and Family Services, and St. Anne's Human Services. Um, they're going to determine need and make sure that the applicants meet the standards that we're looking for. Uh, tried to keep it pretty simple. You couldn't have already received Share the Warmth, so no double dipping. Uh, you can demonstrate direct, direct financial impact due to COVID, so job loss or extended illness. And you must meet income and eligibility requirements for some of these other social programs out there like Fuel Assistance, SNAP, Unemployment, WIC, Head Start. Um, and then once we get those approved applicants from the social service agencies, we should be able to distribute the funds prior to the July 1 date. So we're looking for you guys to approve that. Any other commissioners have any uh, questions for Jackie? I just have a quick question. So if they get the money, um, is it going to them directly or is it going towards their bill? Sure. So get, it's actually applied as a credit on their electric bill. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Directly to, to electric, not cable. Okay. Anyone else have a question? If not, can I have a motion to approve uh, the COVID electric relief program plan? I'll move. Okay, Michael. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Okay, Maria, thank you. Okay, we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Trippi? Okay, I see it's a question, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, Michael. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I just wanted to understand better what is our kind of cutoff policy and 
and has that changed over time? Should that should we reflect on that given this year? It sounds like maybe we have extended it. I just wanted to get a better feel for what was the policy, what is the policy, how many cust maybe if we know how many customers are we talking about, just to get a better feel for what's what the real situation the underlying situation is. Sure. So typically um applications are due to us from these agencies by March 1st and the funding is applied March 15th um, through Share the Warmth. It's on the electric bill just like this would be. Um, but we had about 50 or 60 fewer applicants than normal and we had anticipated actually more this year. Um, I think there was a disconnect just because places were closed. They couldn't go seek assistance in person. I know we had quite a few fewer applications from the council on aging. And um, the senior center was closed for a good portion of the year. So I think that's what you're seeing here. I, I think the well, question, is, question how is many, how many people are actually in need? Oh, uh, so, so we don't have a maximum number of people who can apply. We take the amount that we have available and we divide it equally um, among the people yeah. who are approved. But Jackie, yeah, how many people? Is, yeah, are, how, yeah are, are in trouble right now. Are not paying. Oh, so oh, how many are on our, our shut off list? Is that what you're asking? Um, yeah, okay. yeah. Thank I'm you. Thank you for clarifying. Issue. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we have about 750 people on the shut off list right now. Um, but some of these balances are extremely high, like thousands of dollars. We haven't done a termination since um, November of 2019, when the winter moratorium went into effect prior to the pandemic. So it's a lot of months of just piling up bills. How many months do you usually go before you turn it off? Is it is it by months or is it by dollar amount? So so we shut off. Um, I think it's usually like ninety days, but with the moratorium, you can't shut them off. Okay, but it's it's generally ninety days, so it doesn't even matter what the balance is. It's like ninety days with non-payment and. Yep. We'll do payment plans, though. We try and help people keep well, on. Well, if they yeah. don't reach out to you and they don't, you know, <laughs> there's nothing, what can you do, right? So Yes, um, exactly. Their, right, okay. I, just, I, I guess but, we're just trying to figure out how you're determining a shutoff. So 90 days is, is, is a determining factor. A, a lot of folks, when they know the moratorium's on, if they're struggling, they just won't pay in the winter because they know that that's sort of null and void. We can't shut them off till we resume in the spring. So this is how we've ended up in a situation uh, with some folks not paying since, yeah, November 2019. So that's a pretty long time to go. So we're, we're in a spot right now where we have, did you say 750 customers, households? Yeah. So those are people who are going to get the first termination letter. Um, that will not be the number of people who get shut off. That goes down. People will pay the bills when they start getting the term notices. Uh, these people used to get shut off. I'd have to compare to previous years that had a similar number, but uh, we do about 20 a day and we do it over two weeks. If that's a ballpark, 15 a day, I think it's 15 a day. Usually we have a full first week and then a second week. I'm sorry, say it again. Did I get reinstated or did they move? What happens? You know, they pay the bill and we turn them back on. Yep. Yeah. Yep. We set up payment plans as well. Now, Jackie, isn't there some other sources of funding from the federal government and the state uh, on these uh, on these bills as well that, that not only that maybe we we can't go after, but the individuals can through other agencies? Are there other means other than just what we're probably setting up here? Yeah, absolutely. We actually put a flyer together um, with information about some of these programs. Some of them are COVID specific. Some of them kind of exist at all times. Um, and we included that in our last reminder notice. So we sent out a reminder, not a not a termination notice, but we sent it to high balance customers who would be on the list, um, letting them know that we were going to resume terminations in July and they should seek assistance if possible. And um, that flyer went out to that group. There were about 300 customers in that group. Jackie, if I, if I may. Yep. We say customers, we mean households, right? Yes, when we talk about a customer, it's a, a metered customer. Yep, okay. one house. But could that be could that be a commercial as well? So this is residential shutoffs that we're working on right now. Commercial shutoffs um, 
are not restricted by the moratorium in the same way. Um, there was a brief period when we were not doing shutoffs at the beginning of the pandemic, but I believe we resumed that back in August and it's been pretty, pretty above board. We haven't had many issues there. In, in a typical year where you've accumulated 750, I understand why we've done that, but what would be the number of households in a typical year? Well, if I may make a comment while Jack trying to see if I can up. find that, yeah. Uh, that's all right. I'll I'll make a quick comment, uh, and and she can fact check this. But I I know you know traditional shut off training has the thirty, sixty, ninety day rule. That way, obviously, folks aren't surprised at ninety days uh, that all of a sudden their power is being shut off. And and I'll have to say is is to give credit where credit's due, you know, in our office, Linda does a very good job in maintaining a personal touch. Uh, I think, you know, as again, I continue to try and, you know, uh, share the public power banner, you know, she has a lot of relationships with folks around town that struggle with bill payments and works with them in a very personal way and is able to vet, um, you know, people in need with those that might be um, maybe stretching the rules or finding loopholes, if you will. And, and, and so we do that and, and we provide ample notice that way, you know, if you get to the point of shut off, you've, you've gone through a number of hurdles that, uh, you know, it's, it shouldn't be a surprise by that point. And, and so I, I think we're fortunate in, in that respect. I'm, tr I'm trying to find the number. I know that we had had, I had Linda pull those numbers for me recently. I'm just not able to lay my hands on them right now, but Mike, I can follow back up in an email to you. Um, yeah. I can say that, um, you know, we usually do 15 shutoffs per day during the first week of shutoffs. And then we uh, see Fewer during the second week, it's people who maybe promised to pay the first week and haven't yet will revisit those for, for termination during the second week. Um, I think we're anticipating, I want to I want to say that the, so I don't want to give you an, I, I, I think I know what the, the number is, but I don't want to give you an incorrect number. So let me just follow back here, up here, through an email. Yeah. Here's my thought. Um, I'm, um, a, obviously people need to pay their bills and we can't run an operation and people don't pay the bills. <laughs> B, it's wonderful to have a, a need program based program. I have no sense that $10,000 is particularly when it's prorated uh, by any cu a customer need is a customer need, no matter what their bill is, that that's adequate. So we don't have a sense when we're voting on this $10,000, is that an adequate number that's helpful in any way? Um, but go back to the point that people need to be able to pay their bills. It's also wonderful that, you know, we have payment plans and we have to figure it out. I'm just concerned that uh, given maybe folks have taken advantage, uh, but given that it could have gotten out of hand as well when folks have taken advantage, of, you know, they're saying, hey, it's a free loan. Why do I have to pay now? But now they're really getting themselves in trouble. What I don't want to see is, you know, 750, I don't know what, how many customers we have, how many households we have, but 750 sounds like a very large number in Shrewsbury of households who have not paid their bill. That's A, a terrible, terrible number, but um, it, it could be a lot going on here. And so, you know, I, I will say that that's, not, that that's not extremely high compared to previous years for the initial okay. round of shut, shutoffs. We're not like okay. completely out of whack on that. Um, okay. This is the first round of notices. A lot of people who've been putting it off end up paying, setting up payment plans, and won't get the second letter for the actual round of shutoffs. But 750 is high, but it's not crazy high. Okay, it, it feels like an alarming number to me, but it's not a number I've heard um, heard before. What I would love is next month getting some report on you know not only. 750 but what what the ranges of these customers are and what they owe and then and then what what who's paid down after the first notice second notice i don't want to micromanage it i just i i it sounds alarming and i just feel as a as a as a commission and as a commission to the community 
we should have a probably have a better feel for this. Um, and this is a much, I mean, I, I don't know why, but I would think in, in my mind, this would be a fewer than 100 customers. So when you said 750, it, it seemed alarming to me. No, I think I think we've seen even up to 800 in the first round of shutoffs over the last few years. Um, okay. but, so but, I wouldn't well, I wouldn't say that 750 is totally out of whack. It's it's more the concern here is a lot of the folks who are on these lists to begin with struggle to pay their bills on a regular basis, and because it's been so long since we've done a round of termination, the folks who've been hit extra hard during this pandemic and already were struggling are going to have a very challenging time trying to set up uh, a payment plan and get and get these bills covered um, you know as we as we begin resuming the termination process um, to, to Chris's point I mean Linda is on top of this stuff this is we know that there's a lot of work to do here but that's why we're making the extra effort to try and connect people with resources that can be helpful to them uh, which was the purpose of the flyer that we'd included with our our uh, reminder notices as well as the intent of trying to put together the second bite at the apple for people who missed out on share the warmth who would have qualified. Um, Jackie, getting back to the comment about um, people kind of using, abusing, you know, abusing it. Right. So people, well, people who do, you know, like, like are there typically like those, like a group that just kind of, like you said, uses it as like a interest free loan. And then like when you go and you send them the notice, they pay it all off in, you know, after, after the winter? Yes. And, to some and, extent, there is a small portion of people who do that. Um, that's to some extent. Okay. So that's, I mean, that's the, just, just that's, the nature of the moratorium. Yeah. That's just abusing, you know, just, t that's just abusing the system. Right. So we're not, you're, some, some, some may be, some may be doing that, but it's not, like the numbers that you're looking at right now, the 750 is more due to, um, you know, just str struggles to pay the bills and not just using this as a long-term. So we can't um, interest. You know, I, note. <laughs> yeah, I can't, I can't. I can't tell you the the personal financial status of everybody who's on this list, right? But what I can tell you is that through the program that we're proposing here. We've got these social service agencies who are going to determine the needs. So, so they have to qualify based on their their income um, and other requirements for these list of well-known programs. They also couldn't have already gotten share of the warmth, and they also have to be able to demonstrate um, financial impact from the pandemic specifically. So it can't just be that they don't work. Did they lose their job during the pandemic or due to the pandemic and prove that point? Um, so. You know, we're yeah. trying to we're trying to limit that to some extent, but it looks like Chris wants to weigh in on that a little bit. Yeah, I just wanted to add one other quick comment, uh, just to, you know, because this is something I, I've worked on over the years, and and it's you, you know, uh, it, it varies community to community, as anyone could expect, based on demographics and other community characteristics. And so, one of the things that I, I think that I had asked Jackie about for this program is if, if you notice in the memo for the folks to receive this type of funding, they have to meet all eligibility requirements as determined by out, these outside agencies. And, and so one of the things to your point about abuse that, um, and again, I, I know this isn't, isn't necessarily, um, well, uh, I'm not sure if it's public opinion or not, but, um, but similar to applying for college, which I, I'm sure maybe some of you are familiar with, you do a whole asset review. And so I've been involved in a surprising number of instances where folks lived in million dollar homes, yet we're on our low income rates and our low income programs. And it's because we're, you know, if, if they have, um, um, and again, I, you know, I'm not an expert on how they did this, but different, you know, consulting careers that, you know, ebbed and flowed with business, or they just had a lower fixed income from a retirement or trust fund. And, and so we've looked at, you know, and, and I had a communi communication with someone out in California where they're finding the same issue as they uh, push electrification. And so that's one of the things we're looking at closely is kind of what I'm getting at with as we try and drive electrification and increased use of, of our products, abuse and rising electricity bills also 
um, drives a need to make sure these programs are being applied appropriately. And we're looking at that as a as an industry. I think it's all Michael, helpful. do you have any other questions? Yeah, I think it's all helpful. Obviously, I got two two little concerns. One is uh, kids can't can't kids can't learn and go to school anymore without having you know they can't just go to school and forget about their problems at home. Everything is about electricity and internet. So if you don't have those things, you're in a backward cycle. So we have to consider families and kids. The second is as we're voting on this ten thousand dollars because we because it was a number we came up with. I'm happy to vote for it. I'm, I'm pleased to vote for it. I just do not have a sense of truly what the need is relative to those who are not just gaming the system, not getting a free loan, but actually have real need. And when we say, well, we'll just take $10,000, say we have 300 customers, 200, I don't know. We divide that by $10,000 and that equals, my math is terrible, 200, whatever. That may not be adequate at all relative to the situation. Maybe it is. So I'm just, I think we're voting a little blindly relative to this particular vote. Um, and I just want, would love a report next month to say, okay, where do we land? Where are we at now? What does this look like? Yeah, I think, I think that that's fair. And we can definitely, I, I, I can either do like a separate memo. I think maybe we could just do it in the general manager's highlights, just uh, recapping this. You know, I, I can say that we usually have around 150 applicants we didn't get that this time. So we know that there's potentially 50 out there who would have qualified for share the warmth who, who didn't this year. So let's just be generous and double that. We're, we're you know, you, you can't force people to take assistance. They also have to follow through and actually apply for it just based on the response we've seen in share the warmth. And, and this could be very wrong, but I'm kind of thinking we're going to end up with maybe a hundred people who apply and, and get approved here through this process. And, and that gives them a hundred bucks each. You know, we're not, we're not, eliminating anybody's debt, but that hundred bucks gets them started in some way. You know, some folks have a $20 a month electric bill and some folks, you know, have a family of five and a big house. And the most equitable way we've been able to do it is just give everybody the same amount in the past without taking into consideration all of this uh, very complicated um, stuff when we start looking at how you determine who gets what you need. So, um, you know, you just I, I trying to do that, something rather than nothing. Sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I mean, no, I, I understand the, the approach. Yeah. And it's imperfect for sure, Mike, but, but I, I, you know, if, if you're, if you're worried about 10,000 not being enough, I mean, you guys commission, you could add to that pool. That's up to you folks. But um, the, I was just basing this on the 10,000 you had originally uh, contributed to the share the warmth fund back in uh, whether it was November or December, can't recall right now. So that's, that's where that number came from. You guys already earmarked this. For assistance and we were just trying to shuffle it down the line here to hit a different pool of customers who have yet to uh be able to get that well jackie okay. I, I, i'm really not commenting on ten thousand dollars i'm commenting on um the underlying issue and and underlying issue given this situation it's just i want i guess i'm desiring more information next month relative to that if we have to potentially throw more money in or maybe we over allocate it for all i know um, it's just where um, it's just a little we're a little blind blind relative to the vote. I'm happy to vote on it. I just I think we have to revisit it next month. Absolutely, and you know, uh, I'll I'll put together a report on that so you guys definitely know how this played out. And um, you know, I hope we never have to do this again. I think the pandemic was uh, a completely unusual, unexpected circumstance, and um, you know, this is just one of the ways that we're trying to react to that and give people. Um, the tools they need to, to, to live their lives and keep the lights on. So. Okay. With that said, we had a, uh, I think a, um, a motion of, uh, uh, in front of us to vote to approve the current policy of the $10,000 to be used in the COVID electric relief program. And uh, in taking uh, Michael's and uh, Maria's comments to heart, we understand that uh, follow up next month with a, a more expansive look at uh, just how you know hard is the, is the crisis right now if is it any worse or you know is it just as well the it, same as every year previous um and we just take a look at it but at least we get a more of a sense of uh, of the um, 
need uh, the elasticity of what the uh, situation brings to the table. So with that, I'm going to do a roll call vote to uh, for approval of the COVID electric relief program. And with that said, uh, Tony, I do approve well, of the- I agree. I also, okay. I also agree with Mike, follow up if you go. Good, okay. Uh, Kelly Marshall. Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. Re okay, thank you. Maria Lemieux. Yes. Okay, Mike Raffolo. Okay, and Bob Holland, yes. Great. I look forward to seeing well, what, what, how this all pans out. We sent out our first letters. We'll see what the response is there. We'll get feedback next month to whether, whether that, you know, we rapidly uh, shrinking that 750 number down uh, and, and what the real needs are behind that. Okay. Uh, great. Definitely. Okay. The next uh, item, item seven, is new enhanced Wi Fi products. So exciting stuff. Um, you know, we're changing um, the Wi-Fi router model that we were using to provide our enhanced Wi-Fi product. And along with that, Calix, who's our vendor, uh, replaced the original app that we had used with that for management called NetValet with a new one called Command IQ. But rather than providing Command IQ directly to customers through Calix, um, it's a white label product. So what we're doing is we're taking their Command IQ app and we're branding it for Selco. It's called Shield by Selco. It's going to have our colors, our logo. We're going to be able to cross-promote programs through it. And it also comes with some pretty neat and powerful tools for our customers that they haven't had before. So uh, the core product itself is, is, you know, home management of your, of your Wi-Fi network. And there are two add-on features that you can choose from. One is called Protect IQ, and that's uh, malicious website protection. It's antivirus um, it protects all of the devices connected at the network level. So where you would have like antivirus on your computer, um, this, this, this stops any malicious behavior, ransomware kind of stuff at the network level and protects all of your devices, even internet of things like your thermostats and stuff like that. The second product is Experience IQ, which provides enhanced parental controls that allows you to kind of drill down to the profile level and allow and deny different content for individual users and devices, access at different times of the day, and really puts parents in the driver's seat in terms of what their kids are able to access, when and how. And um, the two apps are available to our customers, and we're proposing um, that they get launched for a premium of $7.50 per month for both of these products. Um, that's pretty much in alignment with what we're seeing for other Calyx partners that are offering these products through their white-labeled Command IQ app. Um, it is a new service, and we think that with folks uh, really wanting to control their networks in new and different ways, it will have a good market for it. Um, one of the complicating factors with doing this is that because we're now launching this new app and these two new products, uh, we have to have privacy policies policy specific to the app because it's not sitting under Calix's name, it's sitting under ours, uh, as well as an end user license agreement. So the content that we are uh, including in this uh, commission memo was really developed using essentially a template that Calix provided to us, as well as uh, on the privacy policy side, trying to match it with some of the language that we already have on our website privacy poly policy, which you folks had uh, vetted and approved uh, a year or two ago. So um, the, the recommendation here is to vote to adopt both the privacy policy and the end user license agreement and launch these two, the uh, two new Protect IQ and Experience IQ uh, products bundled at $750 per month for both for those customers uh, wishing to opt into the service. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Yeah, yeah I, have a, I have a question. I'm just wondering, what's the, is there a uh, certain number of a minimum number that we have to have as subscribers? Are we paying a base price for this? Uh, uh, like a minimum number of subscribers required? And do you have a sense of what the profit margin is to the product? So, yeah. So it's based on the number of devices that we are rolling out. Um, we, because we're doing this in conjunction with the fiber rollout as well, we think that we'll be able to hit the, the minimum numbers. I think the the first number of devices we had to buy was a thousand um, or commit to. Um, and I think that's over a couple of years. 
And then the apps themselves, I think, charged to us initially is two fifty each. So at seven fifty, uh, we have thirty three percent pro, or you know, thirty three percent of that is profit because um, we're going two fifty over what it costs us. Uh, in terms of price breaks, as we roll out more and more of these devices, the cost per app that two fifty per app per month uh, goes down for us, uh, but. I'm not sure the timeline on that. Uh, it's gonna we're gonna have to see how quick the adoption is as we couple this with the fiber product. Are, are we ever losing money at the outset because of a minimum requirement, or it, it we make dollar from app from uh, subscriber one? No, we make we make money from subscriber one. The uh, okay. the requirement wasn't necessarily for the number of subscribers buying into this app. It was for the Calyx devices that we're purchasing which we know we're going to need as part of this fiber project. So we've already committed to those. Okay. Any other questions from any other board members? Hearing none, uh, I will entertain a motion to uh, approve, uh, to adopt the, uh, sh uh, the shield by Selco application privacy policy statement and adopt the, uh, the proposed Shield by Selco application and user license agreement and launch the new Shield by Selco enhanced Wi-Fi app management uh, services uh, at, at uh, $7.50 per month for both products. Do I have a motion? Uh, I move that we move it as stated. Okay. Do I have a second? A second. Second, okay. Uh, with that, we will uh, take a roll call vote to approve uh, the implementation of these newly enhanced Wi-Fi products, uh, starting with Mr. Trippy. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Kelly Marshall. Yes. Okay. Maria Lemieux. Yes. Uh, Mike Raffolo. Yes. And Bob Holland. Yes. Okay. The, the motion is carried. And the next, we'll move, take, move to the next uh, line item is review and consider approval of the business fiber packaging and pricing. So that's me okay. again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So when we launched our business fiber product uh, back in 2017, the intent was not necessarily that it was going to become like your basic retail product that's out there. It was more aligned to compete with... Um, a direct fiber package, a higher level, higher end business product. And our approach at the time was we brought in a, a consultant, a contractor, do door to door sales for us. And he was really kind of trying to uh, help us set the pricing and, and packaging for that. Um, things have evolved. Uh, that gentleman's no longer with us. The door to door business model is not really working. Uh, fiber is a retail product, it's what we're going to be selling. And the pricing model that we're currently using doesn't match that. Uh, particularly for the actual product that we have is more of a retail product rather than a custom product. So the proposal here is to try and better position our, our fiber packages on the business side to uh, drive more adoption from our lowest end business users uh, who are currently on the old DOCSIS uh, cable modem packages. Uh, the, the, the largest slice of our business customers right now or on business internet, and that's seventy dollars a month, sixty nine ninety five. Um, and and today our lowest fiber package is one hundred and fifty nine ninety five per month, which a is out of alignment with the rest of the market, and b is a huge jump for a business customer looking to make the move to fiber. Uh, with with all of this fiber infrastructure that we're rolling out into the field, that's what we want to see. We want to get people off of that old DOCSIS plant and onto our fiber plant. And I think that the best way to do that is uh, with a package repositioning. Our uh, market research looking at other NCTC members, large and small providers across the country, uh, as well as local providers here in Massachusetts, what we're finding for commonality was their tier one or lowest level fiber business package is under 100 bucks. Uh, the tier two is somewhere between 100 and 150, 160, and tier three ranged about 200 to 300. So with our current pricing model, we're not checking any of those boxes. Uh, the, the package proposal that we have today, uh, we have an enterprise package, which is 250 over 250. All of our packages are symmetrical, so I won't uh, bother doing that for the next one, but it's $159.95 per month. 
Next package is Enterprise Select. It's 500, and that's 500 over 500, I guess I will say it. <laughs> 299.95 per month. And then the Enterprise Premium is a gig symmetrical, and that's 449.95 per month, which is pretty high compared to that 300, 250, 300 dollar mark that we're seeing on the tier three for other providers. Um, so what we'd like to do is we'd like to sort of eliminate the enterprise package, uh, which is at 250, 250 for 159. And we'd like to reposition our enterprise select, which is the next package up. We're going to keep it at 500 over 500, but we're going to reprice it to that 159.95 price point. We're going to take our enterprise premium, which is the top one. We're going to leave it at a gig and we're going to reprice it to match what enterprise select is today. So it's 299.95. Um, what we'll do is we'll take anybody who's on that select package and move them to the premium and anybody who's on the enterprise package that's going to be discontinued and move them to the select. What that does is it gives all of the customers who are currently on enterprise uh, twice the speed for the same price. It takes everybody who's currently on select and gives them twice the speed for the same price. It takes everybody who's currently on premium, they get to keep their speed and they're going to pay a fair price for it. So they'll actually see a reduction from $449.95 per month to $299.95 per month. There are only, I think, six customers on that package. So today is the day to do that before we start rolling fiber out and making people choose these packages and all of a sudden we have a huge pool of customers on that. Um, with those changes, we're also going to launch a new low-level one that we're going to call Enterprise Business. And this is the package that we're hoping is going to lure more migration from our low-level business cable modem customers to this fiber product. And that one's going to be 150 over 150. So it's a little bit faster than the package that we're offering on the cable side. Um, and it's $89.95 per month. Uh, so that's $20 more per month, which is a heck of a lot easier for a small business to swallow to get those symmetrical speeds and the reliability that you can have with fiber. Um, we think we're going to see a lot of traction with it. And with those changes, we're going to check all of the boxes for the pricing models that we saw as we took a look at the marketplace. So that's a tier one under $100, a tier two in that one to 160, and then tier three in the 200 to 300. Um, you know, it puts us, uh, we, have a, we have a chart included in the, uh, in the commission item there. And uh, I mean, it puts us right in alignment with where we need to be. Uh, we're matching um, Concord on our first package. You know, we're matching Chicopee on our second package. And uh, we're, we're right in the ballpark on our third package. We're at a gig and it's, it's $300 a month. So we think that that's uh, a really solid move uh, from a strategy perspective. The other thing is, as it pertains to fiber, is Lakeway Commons was our first fiber to the business, fiber to the home deployment. And when we did it, it was sort of a pilot. We allowed customers to take a new fiber package or we let them take an old cable motor package, but we were delivering it to them over an ONT. As we've started to roll out fiber, um, it's become more problematic to do that where we're delivering the old packages over the ONTs. It's a little more complicated to keep track of all these different packages and what we need to set up. And back in March, um, the commission voted uh, to move all of our residential customers at Lakeway who were on a cable modem package to fiber packages. They've all been upgraded to the correct packages. And we'd like to do the same thing on the business side. So we're looking at moving 21 business internet customers to the new enterprise business package. So that's uh, from $69.95 a month to $89.95 per month. And seven commercial internet customers from their commercial internet package to that enterprise select. Um, and that's $129.95 per month to $159.95 per month. All of these customers would see uh, not a terrible increase in their bill, uh, but they would get faster speeds, symmetrical speeds, um, and it would bring our policy for deploying fiber packages to ONTs in alignment with this particular location, which is the only place in town when we're not uh, in compliance kind of with our, with our current practice. So that's the proposal. And I can go back over it or, or show charts if you folks want me to throw anything up on screen. Does anybody have any questions? It looks to me that basically what we're doing is going to, going to jack up and give people symmetric higher speeds or, or higher data rates. Um, and 
with a slight increase in some cases, but for those that were already getting the highest services we get, they actually get it for a lot less. Yes. Okay. And that's only on the business side. This, this does not address what we'll be doing on the residential side. Correct. Okay. Uh, Michael, do you have any questions? I know that. Okay. Maria? Anyone? Uh, Kelly or Michael or uh, Tony? Any questions? No. If, if not, can we have a motion to accept the uh, the new business the new uh, business fiber packaging and pricing uh, program? Oh, good. I move that we accept it as stated. Okay. Do we have a second? A second. Okay, Michael. We have a second. Okay, we're voting to approve the business fiber packaging and pricing. Uh, uh, program as presented. Okay, right, uh, roll we'll call let's... vote, uh, to Mr. Trippy. Okay. Yes. Okay, Kelly Marshall. Yes. Yeah, Maria Lemieux. Yes. Michael Rapolo. Yes. And Bob Holland. Yes. Okay. the The next uh, agenda item has us. Uh, I, I believe it's the employee handbook update. And uh, Tracy, is that you that's going to be handling that? Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay. Floor is yours. So... Thank you. So most of these changes are to be in um, tandem with what the town just voted to change uh, with their personnel bylaws. Um, so the first two are to recognize Juneteenth as a holiday, which the state had voted on, and to also um, kind of rebrand Columbus Day as Indigenous Peoples Day as well. Um, Miscellaneous leave in our handbook is going to be changed for bereavement, is going to recognize step family members. Um, additionally, we're going to put in a clause there where to say that we can request documentation from employees if they are taking bereavement leave, which is fair. Um, there's also an in training period where it's like a, a more user friendly way of saying a probationary period for new hires just at the end of six months if it's not working out we reserve the right to tell someone and it kind of makes it a less awkward conversation and then the last item which is separate from the town is to give 15 weeks of sick time uh, from the date of hire right now when you're hired you have zero sick time uh, especially with COVID, it's kind of made everyone rethink what we should be offering. I know um, places I previously worked six times started right away. And again, that's the type of thing where you would have to provide documentation. We're not just going to let people call in. So that's it. Any questions? Well, I think at town meeting, we approved uh, for the town employees, they approved mm -hmm. the uh, Juneteenth and then the indigenous slant Columbus Day uh, yeah. name change though and all, only so it added one holiday state holiday but it's a state mandate anyway so that's uh, on Juneteenth um, and then the other ones I have no issues with but uh, I'll open it up to any of the uh, commissioners have any other comments questions for uh, Ms. Schultz uh, is the 15 weeks um, sick time up front is that consistent with what the town offered no uh it is for uh, after one year of service, yes. That's the only change, is it would just start right away instead of a year. And what's our um, logic relative to being different from the town benefit? Um, just that we feel that it's a more, I want to say, generous offer, but also uh, to help people make the decision to come to work at Selco. Uh, a lot of the time you have municipal utilities um, do offer better benefits than the town. I can jump in too, Michael, and just say as a uh, new hire, when, you know, I, I had worked with Chris for, you know, a little over two years at Belmont Light, and, you know, so I, when he had contacted me, offered me the role, he had sent me, you know, the benefit package and I looked at it and that was one thing I'd flagged right away, especially during COVID. I was like, so what happens if I get sick with COVID? Now to also let you know, my first week at Belmont, they had to send me home because I have a cough, I had a cough. That's the type of employee I am. I never, never hesitated to come to sick if I or come to work sick 
if I felt as though it was just a little thing, you know, if it would, you know, I could still get my work done, whatnot. I think with COVID, the mindset has shifted a little bit where if I can spread something to somebody, I either have to have the ability to, to work from home or, you know, some sort of sick time to be able to use. Um, and with absolutely zero to start with, it, it was a big concern with me just talking with Chris and there were other avenues because of, you know, COVID relief at this time and stuff like that. But I think going forward to keep competitive with, you know, the municipal, uh, I should say the utility world, we're not just competing with, you know, municipalities. You're competing from talent with, with the utilities, the IOUs. So Eversource, um, National Grid, those are the type of um, places that I would go to look not necessarily that you know a town hall municipality so just to kind of give you kind of an outside perspective of somebody new this was one of my first kind of flags of oh no sick time starting in covid this is interesting um that's very helpful thanks for that insight and if i may add just a, a timing comment as well so uh, i don't know how everyone else feels but you, you know the the reopening uh, process came a little bit more rapidly than I had anticipated. And so, you know, one of the advantages we have as, as a, you know, a, a public power agency is that we can adapt quickly. And, uh, and, you know, there is that whole, as you just pointed out, the whole town meeting process on the municipal side. And, and so this is, you know, one area where we have 10% of our workforce uh, is, is new as of COVID and hasn't met, you know, uh, a lot of other individuals. And so uh, I think this is just one uh, component where we change the, the zero to one uh, year requirement because uh, I'm sure no one ever expected to do recruiting during a pandemic. Um, and and uh, it brings us more in alignment as, as we expect other recruitments and we had I mean, I know it seems like an anomaly, but we had several retirements in, in my first 10 months. Um, and, and so then as we, you know, and again, I'm looking for anyone to fact check, but we've at Selco seem to have primarily had success recruiting entry level roles where you don't have other experience to come with. So if anyone on this call ever applied and had 30 years of experience, we'd say, well, you have to start over on all of this. And, and so, um, you know, there are other policy updates that we've flagged that we can adjust over time, but it was at least my position that during COVID, we should address the sick leave component first, and then we can talk about bringing other policy matters in more of alignment with how the retirement system attributes, uh, you know, tenure with how long you've not just been at one particular organization, but how long you've been in the retirement system and other, others like that. But I, I think just removing that first zero to one year component uh, makes us a lot more uh, competitive with, with how sick policies are applied for, uh, you know, uh, implemented at other um, municipal utilities. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, any other of the commissioners have any co comments or questions about the uh, proposed change to the um, employee's manual? And hearing none, I'll ask for a motion to accept the changes as uh, proposed uh, uh, for the Selco Employment Handbook, which includes the uh, holiday change uh, in the general definitions uh, of, of um, employment and then also the uh, sick time issue. Yeah, I, I move that we accept it. Let's stay. Yeah. Tony, do you have a second? I agree. We should stay competitive. In the Say again, Tony. Competing with a lot of different people. I said I agree with. We have to stay competitive. For competing with a lot of different utilities and yeah. other people. Yeah. Good. I agree. Okay. Uh, uh, do I have a second? A second. Okay, Mr. Rafolo. Thank you. Roll call vote to approve the. Uh, Employee handbook changes. Uh, Mr. Trippy. Yeah. Okay. Kelly Marshall. Hey. 
Okay. Uh, Maria? Yep. Yes. Okay, Michael? Uh, yes, with a, just a... Um, just a statement. Um, I don't know, Chris. Are you, are you going to report on, you know, with what going coming back to work is? What are there? Is there stay-at-home policies? Are you still mulling it through? And just want to get an update on that, you know, relative to what what we were two weeks ago and what we are on Friday. <laughs> and, okay, to finish up what we had uh, first. I'll see I'll that vote, happen quickly. I'll vote for the changes what, to the uh, to the manual. And so those are done. And now, Michael, you can continue on. What you're looking for is to return to work. Yeah, return to work policy. and Or maybe you're not there yet. I'm figuring out that policy. but wondering where you're at relative to it. Uh, absolutely appreciate the, that question. We actually had, I'd, I'd call it a healthy discussion uh, this morning as a, a leadership team, if you will, about what that looks like. Um, so as of Yesterday, uh, we did, well, basically, I should take a step back. As, as folks may know, the town hall is incorporating a soft reopening tomorrow. Uh, and so in preparation for that, we, we brought our in, uh, customer, well, and the driver for that is obviously being available for folks that are coming in seeking service and work out the bugs with what a transition plan looks like in short order to, to that point. So we, our customer service folks came back Monday along with everyone else. So our, uh, as uh, not to leave them out, uh, service area is, has been staffed for a while as uh, their outside plant folks. And so really town hall is now back at full capacity as of yesterday. And, uh, and so we're working through to your exact point, some of the policy matters with respect to when are masks supposed to be worn uh, how do we enforce that as supervisory folks? You know, what does it mean to have a vaccine? How does guidance from the CDC apply with respect to localized policies that we might have and how employees uh, inter interpret that with how they con conduct themselves at work? Uh, and, and so we don't have, um, like you pointed out specifically, a, a formalized work from home policy that is absolutely on the table. Um, for something to be more formalized uh, at the, given how fast we're, we're moving with this, it, we've been fortunate that I, I think everyone's been very flexible and, and we haven't seen any resistance with that. And, but uh, at least from my standpoint, I, I, I hope you would concur. Um, you know, we have been flexible. If folks have a, a need to, to work from home, you, you know, we, we uh, have been flexible to allow that uh, on an as needed basis, although it's been infrequent, you know, I probably one hand how many times that's come up, but, uh, but longer term, absolutely. That's something we're looking at. And, um, I think to, to the point of this last agenda item, a, a work from home policy is something we look to incorporate into our handbook. Uh, and so that's on our, our longer term plate for, uh, a formal adoption. I think I hit all the points there. Uh, so, so we, we're back uh, and we're working through what it means for meetings and how many people can be in a room and things like that. Okay. With that said, I'm going to turn the floor back over to you, uh, Chris, because now we're into the Selco employment hand, oh, no, correction, we're into the general manager's highlights. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, just starting from the top here, I, uh, and please, I always, uh, you know, freely accept uh, constructive feedback, both uh, harsh and, and otherwise. But uh, I, I added this section at the top here, legislative bits. And I know for, it seems like for a long time, and, and we have some in here that Jackie in, incorporated, we had these other news components that were, you know, good reading for context. And so one, one thought I had here as we launch into other discussions about rates and power supply and strategic planning um, that folks may not uh, watch uh, the news and have live streams to every potential industry change out there like I do. And, and, and you know, some people go to the movies. I go to, you know, different online article databases for, for enjoyment. Um, but, uh, 
I, you know, the list could be long, but these were ones that I thought were more relevant to try and, and help give some context to um, what I think are key issues, both current and future. And, and so I, I certainly didn't want to go through each one. And uh, but my intent here, and, and please tell me if it doesn't work this way, but I, I did test a few where you can copy and paste the the primary bullet point into your Google browser and it will bring up the article. Uh, but each one has has some context here. And, and just because this is the first one, I'll, I'll hit a few of these um, just to, to add. So as you'll see in, in, in the other uh, later parts of this GM highlights, I added in some of the EV information just to add context to some of our proposals for Centec, uh, you know, the Edgemere Diner, uh, that you'll see in, in that section and just that, um, you know, to, to add some of the in industry insight where, where other utilities are, are um, you know, pushing for, for this type of technology. So that's on the EV front. Uh, you know, wind, you know, some of these are, are foreshadowings, you know, for, for instance, the Mayflower wind article. It, you know, the intent there is, is to highlight that these are projects that folks may or may not be aware of, but uh, that, you know, through our involvement with MWIC or even independently, we've had other opportunities just come through the network of folks that I or, or others may know to, to be incorporated in our power supply portfolio. So that's just to say, you know, Mayflower, and the other wind projects, you know, we're actively pursuing participation opportunities where available. Uh, so if you, you, you hear about that, my hope is you can refer back to this type of article to get a little more context. Um, I, I did in, in, incorporate uh, uh, the Burlington electric rate increase. And, and I did want to touch on that one just because you could ask, well, why do we care what Burlington, Vermont does besides Jackie? Um, but uh, uh, that is, you know, as we look at charging stations and power supply, one of the things that I, I don't know this for a fact, but I, I did want to highlight it here is this article does, you know, first it, it says, well, look, Burlington Electric, a 7.5% rate increase. That's substantial. But it's the first one in 12 years. And so I, I mentioned it is if you read the article, uh, you know, at least my rate training has indicated that the threshold for public tolerance of a rate increase is around 9%. And, and that's, you don't even want to go there, but that's, you know, before they get out, they, you know, pounding on your door, uh, that's around 9%. And, and so one of the things that I, um, you, you know, I guess suggest might be the, the word to that we consider as we look at our finances and, and get a uh, financial health checkup with MWIC uh, in the future. These are you know some future projects that we incorporate a more gradual rate increase as needed. Where you know my past strategies have been you know to to sneak in a one or two percent on a more regular basis as opposed to what a Burlington Electric did, where you have a seven and a half percent increase after 12 years, you know, so um, people expect, at least in my estimation, and even me personally, that, you know, cost of living goes up and, you know, and, and other commodities increase in price is just a matter of, of living in society. And so trying to stay, keep pace with that. So I just threw that in there and, and that touches on a little bit with the other agenda item about uh, folks that haven't paid their bill in a while. And, and and things to be mindful of as, as we make sure our rates are are capturing our costs and also in, in protecting us against uh, contingency plans. Um, and then other ones are, are just uh, more what I, I thought were interesting and, and perhaps you would too. Uh, and the last one I just wanted to highlight because this is kind of a soapbox of mine, um, but the last bullet is the main legislators announced plan to convert states IOUs to consumer ownership. Uh, so one of the things, and, and again, because Salco has been such a good steward of the, <laughs> of the points made in this article, is, you know, right there, the, you know, the, if, the, if the article has a paragraph that I think really hits home, it's the, the 
public power agencies in Maine are 58% lower rates than, than the, the private utilities. And so as, as we go launch into discussions with the new climate legislation and other opportunities, that goes back to funding. People just like, well, how much does this cost? Can we do it or can we not? And so all the while, if you're in the 300 other cities and towns in mass that aren't served by public power, you're, you're, uh, are, you know, pretty darn close to paying double what a Shrewsbury resident pays. And so that's a lot of financial capital that's not being addressed through legislation in Massachusetts. And so, you know, this is something I think to keep an eye on as you'll see the article, you know, a couple of bullets above, you know, the, the IOUs in Connecticut are under fire for doing a lousy job. Maine's under fire for being expensive and doing a lousy job. You know, Massachusetts is sandwiched in between. So it's only- Well, Chris, of some of those are actually, uh... Um, not even U.S. owned co corporations that, that right? The... <laughs> that, 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 that's another one. Again, I've already spent too much time on this one. I apologize for it, but that's exactly it. That They, they even had a, a homeland security issue because Central Maine Power is owned by Spain. And so Spain said, well, this is our utility. We want all the access to your grid information. And, and the, the Homeland Security had to step in and say, uh, uh, this is critical stuff. You know, I don't think so. And they're like, well, we own it. And they're like, eh, too bad. I mean, that was very, uh, a very crude summary uh, by yours truly. But that's the essence of how well, that went down. And National Grid is, is ultimately owned by England. You know, and, and so it's, it's one of those things that, you know, is, is policymaking you know, marches on, you know, is, is are we okay with that? You know, who's to stop other countries from buying these critical assets? So anyway, I'm, I'm happy to answer any and all questions um, at any time on that stuff. But um, into the meat of Selco, bringing it back to, to a, a more local flavor, um, you know, in the engineering compliance section, you'll see the projects that we're working on um, on an ongoing basis. Uh, so, uh, you know, not to de-emphasize it, but in the interest of time, uh, I'll just highlight some of the uh, topics there. Oh, I'm sorry. And, uh, um, and AMI, just because that's the biggest one, I figured I, I'd stop on that one. AMI, we do have the meters in, um, but as, as folks have may have read, you know, there are shortages with materials and microchips and things like that. So, we're waiting on the gateways or, or collectors, if you will, that, that aggregate all of the communications from the meters. Those are probably doing, and, and please someone uh, that might uh, quality control me on this one. Uh, I think those are doing in August. So there's about a three month delay on getting those uh, electronics delivered to be, um, to be deployed out in the system. So we do have meters, but we don't have the collectors yet. And that's, uh, that's the, the bottleneck for, for an ultimate deployment there. Um, so on, on the integrated resources and communications front, uh, you know, we, we went back just uh, um, continuing a discussion from last, last meeting, the AMC networks agreement uh, was came back very competitive, basically the pricing as as it is today. So we just took the liberty of, of renewing that contract uh, rather than canceling the content for for folks. So um, given that was seemingly a, a non controversial adjustment for for the AMC content, so that that's extended and the details are there. Um, and then on the the EV chargers. And power supply, I, I would just highlight those two, you know, Jackie and Patrick and Ralph are continuing to work on um, securing the appropriate stakeholder approvals to deploy our first level two or perhaps level three chargers. Um, and then, you know, same with the uh, town meeting vote with uh, the Centec property, you know, chargers are an option there. And then we did get a, um, uh, I guess an, a, an email invitation, if you will, from the town manager's office for ideas about what to do with the Edgemere Diner parcel. And, and so Jackie uh, and her team drafted up, uh, I guess, a, a uh, idea 
slideshow with you know converting that into a, a if you will a selco gas station where you have um, a, a cafe type of scenario where you plug your car into a level three charging station and grab a coffee for 30 minutes and you have a full charge uh, and so those are the things that in conjunction with the ideas we can then go out and and if if we see that there's meat on that bone we can go secure grant money uh for because those are kind of on the uh, the cutting edge side so there's certainly more uh you know uh, innovation funds available for that type of action um, and then the fiber to the home, I, I do apologize for the sideways and tiny uh, diagram. Again, I, I do like a good eye test every now and then. So this is, this is this iteration of that. But hopefully if you look in the shared drive, we in included a, a standalone document that you can zoom in and scroll and manipulate. Uh, so the, the idea there is we're basically wrapping up the fiber build out for phase one. And, and so, again, as you might expect, the underground areas are the slowest to be completed. So as we highlighted there, it's around 90%. And so two of the big changes that I just wanted to uh, reiterate is that we did uh, ask the contractors, we, we amended the contracts to stop the uh, premises installations. And that way, um, you know, we, we, we believe we'll be able to handle that between in-house or future contractors that when, when the service is more readily available and we have the, uh, head end ready to light the service that, you know, we'll, we'll intrude on people's properties at once, if you will. And so that way, as I think I, I described it last meeting is, you know, even for me, if, if I'm getting a, a fiber drop installed on my property, that's symbolic of service being available. And, and so we're not quite there yet. So we, we've, and, and that was our biggest sore point. I will have to admit with notifications of customers. And, and so we just, we, we ratcheted that back and, and we can get those drops installed when the, when service is initiated. Um, and so then I, I guess the, the with the map too, speaking to that a little bit more, you'll see we're, we're trying to uh, give a little bit better sense for when each phase and each node will be available for service. So that's the eye test. But if you zoom in on the individual document, you'll see that's where we have narrowed it down to quarters. Um, you know, I, 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 I think going more granular than that gets challenging because we just don't know how each road or node or construction scenario is going to pan out. So if we give ourselves a leeway of a few months, I, I think the idea is to set that as an appropriate expectation and, and not um, mislead anyone with, with inaccurate information. Um, and then uh, these are just, you know, after that chart, there are just some details that go with uh, our fiber operations. And I'm happy to speak to, to any of those. We did have a, a cable outage with uh, an equipment failure, which is, is something that happens from time to time, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, as we saw that, the, I think the, the no takeaway point there is a, it was an hour. So that, that's, that's, a, uh, I think, a very respectable response time to getting that uh, restored. So kudos to those that, that were able to jump on that quickly. And, um, and then the internet report after that. So I'm happy, again, anything I didn't touch on, happy to speak to it. But I, I think those were the items I wanted to call, uh, call out um, as, as the most interesting. Well, thanks a lot. Hey, any of the um, commissioners have any other questions, comments uh, for Chris or any of the staff before we uh, ask for closure? Um, Chris, thanks for that quarterly rollout. I think it's excellent. Um, is that something that's on the website or how is that? Is that just an internal document? What's the, uh, how is that? The, the idea is to incorporate that on the uh, Selco Fiber Project website and um, I cannot believe I, I have now blanked on the actual URL for that. I'm sure Jackie has it memorized. Selcoupgrade.com. We, we haven't incorporated that yet, but we, we will be getting there. 
if we've yes. got the sign off on it. So that do you think this there we go. Do we think it would make it in the newsletter as well, or how, how do you? Oh, uh, certainly. We certainly could do that. I guess that uh, if Jackie, if you think that's a possibility based on published timing. Yeah, I mean, obviously, when you're looking at that, that's hard to see. I don't know if we'd print that exact thing in the newsletter, but I think once we get the uh, the map on the website updated and it's a little more searchable and usable, uh, we'll put a blurb in the newsletter pointing people to that to try and get a better uh, pinpoint on the timeline for their neighborhood. So uh, we, we'd likely do it that way rather than just publish the map. Yep, that's great. Anyone else? If not, I'll entertain a motion to uh, adjourn. And our next meeting is uh, scheduled for Monday evening, the 21st of June at 7 o'clock. Do we have is a motion to adjourn? Is that going to be in the town hall? Pardon? Is that going to be in the town hall? I think it's still going to be on Zoom. Uh, it, based on some of, the, uh, some of the other meetings, I think until such time as we're sure, plus the uh, the viability of being able to record while we're on the Zoom for for uh, placing it on uh, okay. SM, SMC probably works for now. That'd be my opinion for the, at least the next meeting, Tony. Okay. okay. So I move that we adjourn. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, Michael. Thank you. And a roll call vote to adjourn. Uh, Tony Trippi. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Kelly Marshall. Yes. Yes. Maria Lemieux. Yes. And uh, Michael Raffolo. Yes. Yes. And it's uh, and Robert Holland. So at uh, um, at eight, it, yeah, at uh, eight uh, thirty-five uh, in the evening, we'll adjourn to uh, recommence on Monday, twenty-first of June, twenty twenty-one, at seven p.m. Thank you all. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Thank folks. You.